Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to KCP Community Meeting, April 12th, 2022. Um, we have a couple of things uh, on the agenda, or one thing somebody uh, mentioned these other projects that might be interesting to discuss, although I don't see him here. If you are here, Guy, Guy, Guy. So, Guy, I don't think so on yet. Uh, I could be a representative oh, sure. Guy if, if possible. Sure, go. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so um, these two uh, suggestions uh, potentially are solutions for the problems that we were talking about. When it came to migrating persistent data from one cluster to another in a uh, scheduled type format, um, I know that um, Ball Sync has about three mechanisms. Uh, there's pretty much a one to one and one to many. Um, as I'm not as familiar with the Cozy Cap, but these are potential solutions that would allow for us to keep multiple sites in a replication pattern to allow for us to um, you know, transition the workloads from one cluster to another. Yeah, so this is this is related to sort of longer term stuff we want to do with our multi-cluster scheduling, where um, if you have a stateful application running in, you know, US East or something, and US East gets hit by a meteor and you need to move it to US West, um, we should capture that uh capture the fact that it is a stateful workload and where that state is and keep a copy keep a backup currently co constantly in sync between us east where it's running and somewhere else where it should be could be running um and then right so so keeping it constantly in sync is something that it sounds like volsync might be able to help us with um which is great because I feel like that's a lot of hard work we uh, didn't really have a good idea for how to do. So if somebody's already looking into it, then excellent. We won't have to. I think we'll still have to figure out how to express um, in in the scheduling uh, inputs, like run this here, you know, run this any of these three places, wherever it is, that's the up-to-date one. But then keep two copies in sync elsewhere, keep n copies in sync elsewhere. Um, to feed into Volsync or whatever to to um, actually do that. But definitely encouraging to hear that other folks are already looking into this, because I think that was something that uh, was sort of intimidating for me personally to think of having to write ourselves. Um, what is, Sean asks, what about something like ramen? What is ramen, aside from a tasty noodle dish? Uh, ramen is ODF's. Uh metro and async dr solution that will do all of like the data recovery operations across stuff and it's baked in at least i i could be wrong i thought that josh was on so he might have a much better uh, understanding of this but i thought it was actually in acm as well and being used for um spoke cluster dr that's right. It's it's not baked into ACM as in you deploy ACM and you get it, but it's part of the uh, the platform plus piece, and it works with ACM's app delivery. And actually, as Ryan was talking about Volsync, it will it they're integrating Robin with Volsync now as well. So it's that orchestration layer to do just that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, Jose, you have your hand up. Yep. I'm also from uh, ODF engineering, as it were. Um, yeah, by and large, Ramen is targeted initially to be the disaster recovery solution for ACM, right? Um, and it's built on top of a number of uh, specific features upcoming and existing including uh, Ceph volume replication, integration with Volsync, um, and different strategies thereof, depending on whether it's regional disaster recovery or uh, metro-wide disaster recovery. The Metro DR actually being, uh, I believe, synchronous volume replication, for example. Um, but these are all dependent on the storage technology underneath. 
for something like KCP, um, it may be more viable to look at optic storage based uh, solutions of which I think Volsync is capable of doing. But um, otherwise we would at present need to bring in the full load of ACM to really make use of it. Yeah, I think I think this exposes uh, like the question really in terms of KCP is how will KCP make this someone else's problem where someone else might be OCM uh, or you know some combination of OCM, Volsync, uh, uh, Raman, etc. Um, but KCP's responsibility is not to do any of this, but to orchestrate and signal to other things how to do this to tell OCM I'm going to put this here, uh, but also keep a backup there. Uh, is, that, right. is that how other people are, are understanding the problem too? Cool. <laughs> um, but this is super interesting. I mean, like, I think this is this is something we haven't uh, really deeply explored, except beyond the the, the hand waving phase of design. Um, you know, definitely. Uh, I'd say that the phases for transparent multi-cluster are uh, schedule anything and then schedule stateless things without downtime, like where where you can uh, move things around without without downtime. Um, and then beyond that, stateful workloads are definitely uh, next. Uh, Sean asked the question, would this be at the sinker layer or some other, oh, where'd it go, or some other layer? Um, I think it, was, it would probably be, oh, sorry? Some other layer. Like yeah. The, the sinker is moving towards being mostly purpose built just to sync things. Uh, like it's, there's a scheduling component that will, will or is split out and evolve so that it handles scheduling and the sinker handles syncing. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, maybe this is a, a the question. Uh, probably should have been awarded differently. I apologize. Uh, I, I kind of meant, is this, would this be something that would live off like at the layer of the API, like the KCP API and Sinker and all the other stuff, or would it live on individual workload clusters? Oh, to handle like yeah. migrating data as needed? Yeah. I think it's something that needs to work with the KCP control plane and transparent multi-cluster to, to make that happen. So I don't know if that means that there's going to need to be agents running in the workload clusters and stuff in KCP. Uh, I, I think that's an area where folks who have time uh, and interest could definitely do some cool explorations. And I think that's, that's kind of where we are at this point is um, we have the location APIs that are in design, and I know that we're going to be working on advancing some scheduling bits. So trying to have the, the folks with the storage knowledge look at that and then think through what sort of um, prototyping could be done to make some of the storage migrations happen. Uh, yeah, Josh, uh, Josh, will you have your hand up first? I, I was just going to say, just, you know, sitting here as we talk about in the last five minutes, I, I totally see Sean, like, at the scheduling layer, something with, you know, ramen being one way to, to put this, put it together and, you know, keeping with some of the way, you know, we expect KCP to expose to the user layer, you know, there's a possibility that we almost, you see nothing, <laughs> you know, we see nothing about it and just like splitter splits deployments, you know, your, you know, your deployment, your stateful deployment is, you know, split between clusters and it fails over as needed, um, you know, using the ramen pieces or something based on the ramen, the ramen technology and one of the sync PV sync tools under the covers versus then there's always the management side where you do expose those up through KCP, but it's it's about more about the fleet and the the admin roles in it. I think there's lots of opportunities to do neat things here. Yeah. Uh Jose. Right. Um 
it's a matter of sort of defining the storage use cases that are needed or are wanted, right? So more or less anything that's stored in etcd can just by default be replicated fairly simply via config map secrets, et cetera. And if you have quote stateless applications, uh, just accessing object storage, the management of credentials becomes highest priority for which the cozy uh, standard uh, might be viable, but also I don't remember what state of discussion the COSI kept is in and whether and when it may actually merge into Kubernetes. So that would be something to keep in mind. And then beyond that, it's a matter of figuring out how you how, how we want to manage PVs, right? It's the PV part that always gets tricky. And one simple hand wave solution is to have storage outside of our managed Kubernetes clusters, right? Have some other Kubernetes cluster or just some other thing entirely dealing with storage and just connect remotely that way. Or, because yeah, uh, trying to manage uh, converged storage as it were via KCP is quite the rabbit hole just offhand. Yeah, yeah. Um. Cool. I guess if anybody is is uh, listening to all of this and wants to go play and explore and see what they can make work, this this is a uh, this is a bit like a like a longer uh, longer future thing that I think KCP is planning for. But that just means you have more time to play and explore and prototype stuff. Um, it's definitely uh, interesting to us. It's definitely something we will want and need uh, to be able to do this with. Um, stateful workloads, but um, yeah, this this looks really cool. Uh, Nick says, potential use case, uh, blue-green changes to logical cluster configuration, picture pivoting between logical clusters, replicating a key space and volumes to n plus one logical clusters. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, let me know or reach out on the Slack if you want to play with this more and we can we can help uh, point you in a direction. Otherwise, this looks really cool. Um, yeah, I guess uh, real quick, an update on uh, me. Uh, Friday is my last day at Red Hat, uh, and so I will no longer be uh, joining these meetings, but I'll still be around in the various, you know, the, the four dozen Slacks we're all a member of. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Ping me on KCP stuff if you want, and I'll help however I can. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, it's been it's been great working with all of you. Um, and uh, we can move on to the next item, which is the point four status check in. Well, yeah. wait a minute. I'm sorry, stupid question. I must have missed the memo. Who's taking over your role here, or are you continuing it from a non Red Hat position? Oh, good question. Uh, I'm not continuing uh, this role on KCP, I would say probably Andy and Stefan continue to be the the um, main point people for stuff uh, in yes. the KCP arenas. Thank you for that affirmative act. <laughs> Otherwise, I feel like I'm uh, just throwing uh, responsibility at people. But yeah, uh, Andy yeah. probably. And thank you, Jason. We will definitely miss you in the community and wish you the best of luck in your next endeavor. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you never go far, and it's a small community. So if you see me at a KubeCon, throw something at me, and we can say hi. Um, all right. Yeah, uh, Andy, uh, do you want to do the, the status check? Yes. Um, so I was looking at the milestone. There's 59 issues and PRs currently in it. Uh, several of them are things that just got uh, thrown in it when we shifted from 03 to 04. So I will probably take a pass, and a lot of these things will just get bumped because they're not uh, blockers for the milestone. But I am curious for folks who are working on things that are in the 0.4 demo script doc and or the work packages doc, um, does anyone have any concerns that they won't be able to meet deadlines for 
the end of the month for being able to um, have things ready to demo. So question number one, anybody have any red flags they need to raise? Sean, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if it was part of the demo for script, but uh, using validating webhooks with API bindings, uh, just due to the fact that you know API bindings are still out and stuff, would be yep. challenging um, to get in. So where more of an am, orange flag than a red flag. Where I'm right now is um, I'm evolving API bindings and API exports based on what's in the demo script. So. API exports are going to get identities, and we need a virtual workspace so that um, controllers can connect to it to see only the things that they should see based on their exported identity. Uh, so I'm going to work with David on getting that in place. And you and I, Sean, should sync up and talk about um, what that's going to look like for the validating webhooks, because I now have a better idea than when we last spoke about uh, how that's going to look in both etcd and in the APIs. So uh, awesome. I'll, I'll be cautiously optimistic that we can get everything aligned at the right time and have it work out. Sounds good to me. Like I said, orange flag. Very good question, though. Um, so for the other thing, let me get my demo doc up. Uh, is um i'm not going to share i'm just looking real quick so uh, the location work i know stefan is the point on that and he's out this week um is anybody working with him on the location demo and the location apis or is that mostly just him mostly just him okay uh so we'll come back to that uh joachim the advanced scheduling bit how's that going well um planning to start that uh tomorrow i would say because i'm still working on the kind end-to-end -to -end tests and getting some well finishing some tests that i owe you all from previous uh prototype so i expect to be able to start working on that this week okay thank you maybe sorry maybe i can add just one point we discussed with that um about that uh, this morning with joachim uh, in fact uh, in in the context of the you know work of uh, future exploration about syncing strategies so which would be obviously for p5 um i had to to do some changes on the sinker uh, especially to manage the you know removal from a location uh, flow which is in fact quite the same as the the provisional one we want to set up for p4 which means that the changes on on the sinker, in fact, would possibly be some sort of you know, skeleton or nearly the same code that what we would use for P4. So I, I'm in the process since I've come back to, you know, preparing the basic sinker virtual workspace for P4 as well. I've just cherry picked this this commit and I'm currently testing the sinker with the basic uh, sinker virtual workspace. So it might be that, in fact, um, we, we can sync with Joachim and, and, and have that part. I mean, the, the sinker part quite quickly down. Then, of course, there is the, the scheduling part and the you know, placement annotations and, and, and flow that has to be um, implemented on top of that. But for the syncing part, at least, we might be nearer than, than, than we thought. OK, cool. Thank you. Um, for the rest of the doc, there's an authorization one, but I don't see either of the folks on for that. So I'll follow up offline. And then the remaining two were the webhooks and bindings that Sean and I were talking about. Uh, in terms of demos, we've got the towards the pull mode sinker. Maru, I know you're actively working on that. Um, still feeling pretty good about the date for that. I don't know if I have a hard-coded date on that, but we are making good progress um, working on getting um, a plugin, kind of a semi-automated plugin deployment, and the intention is to actually use that directly in testing. So we'll be validating the path the users will be 
using against kind. And for the in-process syncer, which we're currently testing, we're going to use, we're going to basically generate the configuration, apply it to the cluster, even if it's a logical cluster, and then read it out to configure the in-process um, syncer. So we're not actually, we don't have a different path. So it, it should replicate really closely what we're going to actually use. Okay, sounds good. And I don't see Antonio here for pod logs. Um, CRDB research, Steve, that's still going well. Steve, if you're talking. Yes. Muted. No, sorry. I'm, this morning is wild. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, uh, the preliminary results uh, that I posted last week look really good. Like we're within the same order of magnitude, basically, even when we're reading and writing with secondary indices. Um, right now, I'm working through uh, deploying HA uh, databases for both and then looking at the impact there. Um, and then I'll start doing like sort of the full suite of benchmarks, which is going to be with and without the watch cache. Um, we're also going to be looking at uh, performance as a function of uh, index selectivity. Um, and then we're going to be looking at some scaling numbers as well. So. Uh, if you guys have, if anyone has any other axes that I should look at or specific things that I should watch out for, I'd really appreciate it. I have, let me uh, shoot a link to the doc where I've been writing down benchmark ideas into the chat real quick. Thanks. So one question I have around etcd versus crdb yep. is, do we, do we have a stopping point and like, how are we going to decide which direction we want to go with? That's a good so, question. Is that something um, you talked about with anybody, like Clayton or anyone else? Yes. So roughly right now, I think, barring any catastrophe on these benchmarks, which I don't expect, um, I think the expectation is we're going to go forward with it because it does simplify our life quite a bit um, on the scaling piece. And then I think the, the largest next inflection point is uh, a presentation that's going to be coming soon to SIG API Machinery. Um, we've been basically talking through how, what are the approaches that might let us put this entry and understanding whether or not that's going to be viable uh, will give us really good insight into how much maintenance burden this is going to give for us. Is this something that's going to live um, in a set of patches or if it's you know just going to be consumed directly from trees? So I think the last two pieces here are, is there a performance gap that we haven't found yet, which I don't think there will be, and then how much maintenance will it be? And then barring any major catastrophe in both of those areas, I think the idea is to move forward with it for KCP. OK. Would it be too soon to try to actually deploy KCP with CRDB in some environment and get people to kick the tires? Um, I don't think it'll be too soon. I think, so one of the things that, um, when I first did the implementation actually on our, with our uh, cube fork, there's a medium to large amount of craft in parts of cube that we're not actively using and I, there's a lot of like exploratory work that was done about a year and a half ago that broke a bunch of stuff and getting crdb to work with that fork of cube took a lot of time um, and so i think before we choose to do a deployment like that we might have to think about how do we undo some of those like there's parts of that cube fork that don't compile right now for instance so i think um, sorry, I'm, I'm very uh, scatterbrained. I think, uh, Kyle, to your question, so I, I'd like to land the changes in the fork in a testable manner. And in, or, in order to do that, we need to make that repo, um, the hygiene a little bit better. So I think it's a little bit out still. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you for that update, Steve. That was, um, Definitely what I was looking for. So much appreciated. 
Uh, the last one on the list is the scoped client and informer generation. Uh, Barsha, Nick, and Fabian, are you all? Um, I, I know we talked yesterday, but uh, for the group here, could you all give an update? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've been working on uh, getting uh, client record generation working with the uh, controller tools uh, framework. Um, I think we're on a pretty good track with that. Um, we're also at the same time uh, looking into the changes that will be needed uh, in the Kubernetes library upstream to support wrapping listers and informers uh, because there's some plumbing there that needs to be done. Um, so we can pass the the cluster where key function all the way through. Um, so Nick is investigating that right now, uh, and and we're just kind of plodding along, getting the uh, client wrappers generated. Um, at the moment, I don't anticipate uh, that we'll have trouble hitting the end of the month, um, but we'll have a much better picture of all the work that will be required by the end of this week. Okay, thank you. Um... If I missed anybody, apologies, uh, just wasn't in the doc. So um, please be or err on the side of over communicating. So if you're running into problems with your work, um, please come chat in Slack or wherever and hopefully folks can help out. If, you, if it looks like something's gonna take way longer and gonna miss the end of the month, please let us know. Um, otherwise, keep on hacking and thanks for everybody's hard work. Uh, back to you, Jason. Uh, yeah. Um, like I said, I don't think there was anything else unless something very recently was added to the agenda. Let me check to make sure before I say that definitively. Um, no. Um, there was a conversation in Slack, though, that I, I wanted to uh, at least surface here and maybe continue here. Uh, Andy, you and Maru were talking about uh, scheduling a namespace to a p to a p cluster hacking things around so that you could force a, a namespace to schedule to a particular p cluster is that yeah is that a um, correct reading of that is that right yeah i was i don't know thinking about stuff over the weekend for whatever reason and this idea popped into my head that we don't have any security right now around um the way that namespace scheduling and syncing is happening in various directions. So I think that um, from KCP to a workload cluster, I don't think you can really override that because it, it, the system does it based on the uh, logical cluster name and the namespace name. And so that, that's kind of, that's deterministic and I don't think that you can really hack that. But that translates to data that I believe is stored in an annotation in the namespace in the workload cluster. So if you have permission to edit your namespace and you change that annotation's value to a different workload cluster or a different namespace, then you potentially could hijack things and try and land in a, like sync your status back to a different location inside of KCP. And so I was just thinking like, that's one example of a potential um attack vector or you know escalation so to speak so we just wanted to raise that and see if we can come up with ways for uh prohibiting those types of actions and any ones that are similar in nature do you mean if i have permission to update the namespace update my namespace in kcp i can update that annotation to be a different value I was saying, if you have permission to edit the namespace in the workload cluster, oh, I see, I see, I see. then you could edit the annotation in that namespace and tell it to go to a different workspace or a right. different namespace in KCP. And okay. I don't know, like I probably would want to sync up with David on the virtual workspace for the syncer to figure out, like, would that restrict things in a sufficient manner such that if you tried to manipulate that annotation that, you know, things would not go awry. <laughs> we could validate the hash, right? Isn't there a hash for those two things that are generated yeah. and stored? So we could... There is a hash, and we certainly can validate that. Um, that's a, a really good idea. I, I think we also had discussed potentially 
changing the strategy for how we name the namespaces in the workload clusters to not use a hash or do something different. Um, so I, I don't know that that's 100% set in stone, but um, yeah, like that that's a great idea. Hmm. Validate that hash on every sync. Uh, when KCP receives some update, check and make sure that it's for the correct namespace and workspace name and the hash matches. Right? Don't just trust the hash, but also validate that it matches. Yeah, I don't, it is I don't know, right. like off the top of my head, like the hash lives downstream in the workload yeah. yeah. cluster. So like you, it gets translated back to a workspace and a namespace. And the syncers just connecting to KCP saying, go to this workspace, go to this namespace. Yeah. So I don't know that the hash really exists at that point, but yeah. it's worth exploring. Yeah. Uh, on, right. the, on the other hand, the approach of the virtual syncer of the syncer virtual workspace is to provide uh, really only what the um, um, physical cluster has the right to see. So, I mean, if for example, some something was changed on the um, on the annotations on the um, physical side that would you know change the logical cluster and stuff like that or or the namespace yeah i mean in any, in any case there, there there should be some uh, checks uh, on on the virtual workspace uh, what about a sinker what about a sinker that is multi tenant in purpose and it, like i guess that kind of gets into the question of what does the deployment look like in a in a shared physical cluster or shared workload cluster, mm. do you if you want like true security boundaries, do you need to run sinkers that are isolated from each other? Because um, I could imagine like within an org, you could run a sinker, but maybe you don't want somebody in a namespace to be able to sync back to a different uh, workspace in that org. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, it seems that it's quite it's still quite open about um you know consolidating workspaces on a single um virt, you know single virtual workspace endpoint but on the other hand also having the ability to provide the only one thinker with several urls several endpoints uh, of uh, virtual sinker virtual workspaces and having you know uh, several you know sinker clients on on the downstream side so we have the ability to do both and then to adjust um according to the use case and especially according to to do boundaries you know domains you know, be it security domains or uh shard domains or stuff like that. that that's that's i mean in the design at least it's it's uh, envisioned and opened mm -hmm. If I understand correctly, it's not just what the sinker can see, it's that it can modify things that other components like the scheduler will pick up, right? So mm -hmm. it's not a constraint of like a pinhole through the virtual workspace because it's the annotation on something that it's perfectly legitimate for it to change. It's just some other component will pick that up and do something potentially nefarious with it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be able to see it. It has to, it, it can, uh modify that hash to some to point to something it can't see but then it will start syncing stuff over there where it shouldn't be able to see i mean it, at least take... in that direction it's just status syncing back to kcp so you know it, it yeah shouldn't be creating things i don't think but but even so like you you no, should no. not be able to escalate what you can access and manipulate but but to take back the the, the idea of of uh, the hash, if we don't keep the hash only on the sinker, but we expect uh, the 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 sinker when updating the status uh, to the virtual workspace, uh, also adding the hash in some you know place annotation or anything else that the virtual workspace is waiting for, then that means that and uh, that that it it would enable uh, check doing this check. I mean. We could yeah. ju it's just a question of, of convention that the virtual workspace is waiting for the hash uh, for any update. Yeah, and I wonder if the, like all of the sinkers calls up to KCP when it needs to talk about a namespace just uses the hashed value and then something mm -hmm. in the virtual workspace code translates it 
if that's yeah, possible. Yeah, it could be as well. Yeah. I I sorry, I don't just a hash uh, value that is like a CRC uh, check uh, value or or you completely replace the namespace with the hashed one uh, when discussing to the virtual workspace. I think the, both options would work. Yeah, we should um, file an issue so we don't forget <laughs> to do that. It's OK. This is recorded. Uh, if we ever need to refer back to this conversation, we'll just find minute 36 of the uh, of the recording. It's perfect. Anyway, uh, Nick has a question. Uh, was there ever was there an alternative to the syncer pattern? Maybe shared key space between logical and workload clusters for certain resources. Um, uh, also, an apology about it being obvious and nonsensical. I don't think there's any such thing. Uh, uh, everything we're doing is nonsensical. Um, Are you asking about like the namespace name is the same in both places? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not trying to like second guess. Like already, like oh. um, oh, no, 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 no. Already the, there. I mean, or... the, the namespace mapping was like something I put together in five minutes. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, yeah. It was not thoroughly designed. No offense, Andy. <laughs> so. Um, I, like the interesting thing is you have a scheduler on the workload cluster and you're trying to uh, replicate resources, if I understand it correctly, um, for different views. Uh, so those resources exist in like the deployment exists in the logical cluster, it's key space as a separate entity than the deployment on the workload cluster. Um, and the syncer handles that, right? Uh, that relationship. Yes. Yeah. OK. So um, what if, I mean, has it been considered uh, when you create a deployment and a logical cluster is, let's say, configured against the workload cluster, um, that instead of doing a replication, there's just one resource in etcd under a, a shared key that uh, both the logical cluster and the workspace cluster um, can access? They're two different etcds, two different control planes, though. What if it's a what if it's a pass through, right? Like like KCP is smart enough for uh, certain resources to do a pass through um, for a given uh, resource. Am I making sense here? Sort of. So. Which etcd are you saying would own a deployment? The workload clusters etcd. And this okay, might be yeah, a problem with so, running across workload clusters, but so the control plane that KCP is owning needs to be the authoritative source of truth for the user's intent, because workload clusters can come and go, and to support transparent multi-cluster and moving workloads around, that information needs to live in. KCP, I suppose it, it could live in a workload cluster, but then we'd have to do a lot more work to move stuff around um, when a workload cluster needs to go away. OK, uh, yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to see if it were possible to do it maybe the opposite direction, where the um, the everything is stored in KCP, but for certain things, workload clusters uh, are configured, I guess the controller manager is configured to point back to KCP uh, for certain resources. So I think we will do something like that for pods, for instance, or we've talked about doing something like that for pods, where the, the uh, actual authoritative source of truth isn't KCP, but then uh, when you ask about the pod status, it, it forwards it down to the cluster, or maybe not. Who knows? That's not written in stone. Um, I think another confounding difficulty of this is we're thinking you're, you're describing it in terms of KCP and one workload cluster. We may have a deployment, one KCP deployment that is split across a dozen workload clusters. Yeah. And so now we have, we're not just coordinating between two things, which is already hard enough. We're coordinating between two tiers of things, of, of 13 things. Yeah, and yeah. at the instance level, and also at the API level, API schema level, which which we have to negotiate. Yeah. So, uh, 
it's not it's not a bad idea i think we will probably do something like that for certain resources but i think um only resources like pods that are I, you know pods have different semantics than deployments you can't have a pod running on two clusters um and it's pretty clear that they're just different sort of beasts than deployments but um I think some of the virtual workspace uh, stuff that David is is doing may make it possible to have. It, that's where we sort of inject the smarts, where where the work the workload cluster can say upload uh, object in namespace hash, and the virtual workspace knows how to reverse that and say, oh, what you meant is update this in workspace X in namespace Y, um, and that's this reminds. That. Sorry, excuse me, Jason. Sure, sure, sure go ahead. This reminds me a bit uh, the work that is being done on pod logs, for example, where we are, you know, setting up a bridge between the logical cluster between KCP and the physical cluster. And yeah. if I remind correctly, um, remember correctly, uh, there was the idea uh, for you know user experience uh, to see your logs, for example, related to a deployment, which can be spread across various clusters. Typically, we would use um, virtual workspaces. Uh, you would just have, you know, a, a, a new type of workspace, which is just a link, and where you can see the pods. And in fact, the the, the real pods they are living in the workload clusters. But then you would have a, um, a, a KCP virtual workspace that would just gather the information and present that, and allow you to to have then the right URLs to, to point to the logs. So that's this type of of things. But but this has to be quite. You know, constraint and 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 design with with limits that allow workload clusters specifics to leak in in on the KCP side. See if I understand correctly. Yeah, uh, Nick, go ahead. Just a, a quick follow up question, um, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. So, what is the um, I guess tolerance? on the from the ux perspective of requiring configuration certain configurations to occur on workload clusters so like um in order to be a workload cluster in kcp you have to uh add this controller or add um this uh uh shim or network configuration into your workload cluster to make um to make it work properly with KCP? I think the, the current target is that you would install the Syncr deployment and, and RBAC for it uh, as necessary. And then when it wakes up, when it, when it starts for the first time, it connects to KCP and says, I'm Syncr for cluster X, give me work. Um, and then also it's a two phase thing because you need to be able to create this workload cluster object in the KCP end to say, this workload cluster is named X. Give it this work. Um, that's a very, very high level uh, summary, uh, which is probably inaccurate in 20%. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, no one is screaming at me that that's wrong. So let's let's assume it's mostly right. OK. Um, all right, and what? Uh, I'm sorry, this is like my final question. What is the tolerance to um, relocating all uh, well, actually, this is a, this is not a good question, so uh, I redact it. Um, all right, thanks. Uh, all right, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, uh, don't think that any of your questions are not worth asking. Uh, feel free to ask either here or uh, on Slack or anything else. Um, uh, if it's a question that we should have documentation for, it's a good uh, uh, a good opportunity to go get documentation. So, um, yeah, did we we came away with some action item to describe the problem and potential solutions, right? To, to maybe we can solve this in the virtual workspace shenanigans, or at least be aware that there's a problem. Right. Um, cool. I guess we have 13 minutes. And unless anybody else has anything else, uh, I think the normal uh, 
the normal thing we do with any remaining time is go through unmilestoned issues. Any business before we go and do all that? All right. Uh, in that case, feel free to drop if this is uninteresting to you or if this is, uh, you know, not, not how you want to spend the next 13 minutes. And I will try to, oh, yeah, I should present this as well. This is, oh, am I presenting? There we go. There we go. Uh, this is unmilestoned issues. Test two sounds like fun. Go ahead and close that. <laughs> um, permission escalation. <laughs> so precious. Um, yeah, is Sebastian? I don't know. I, I think the test makes sense. Uh, I don't think that we have time to do that unless folks have spare time and they're not already assigned to stuff for 04. So I would either put it in TBD or 05. It's TBD. It. Um, audit events. The link to Slack. Do we think this is a TBD of the five? Um, I think it would be, if we're going to start using audit logs, then we'll need this. So I'll be aggressive in adding things to 05, and then we can always kick them out later if we need to. Yeah, that makes sense. This one um, has a PR that I just need to get back and review. So let's put this in 04. Should I put that PR in 04 as well? Yeah, if it's not already. Oh, it is. Nice. Um, this one. I think Sean was going to work on it, but he's got the API bindings uh, or the validating webhook stuff first. So, um, or you know, anybody who, who's got time can work on it as well because it's not currently assigned. I tried to assign it to Sean, but was having trouble. I don't think it would let me. Um, yeah. So, do any like be great. org or something? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It would be great to get this into 04, but you know, I'm gonna be realistic about timelines. So we'll put it there, but it, it's not a um, milestone blocker. Yeah. Cool. This one, I think there's some debate about whether or not we're gonna keep CRD puller as a standalone command. Yeah. Um, or at least that was the debate in the PR, so. Um, I think we need to resolve that before we can really decide what to do. Is CRD puller actually used in anything in our, I mean, we're like aggressively moving stuff toward the pull mode sinker completely, right? Do we yeah. need CRD I mean, puller at all? CRD puller is, is only, I mean, as a command line in, is only useful if you don't, if you want to have your APIs, uh, before joining your physical cluster, right. then you right. can, you know, that that's the only, the only use case. Because Which doesn't really the, suggest it's. I mean, the pull mode sinker is having the import API import integrate into it, so there's no way to not have it happen as part mm -hmm. of syncing as well. I mean, I'm saying that I'm not saying that's a permanent decision, but that's kind of the near term way we're going. To not have a to not have CRD puller at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. Maybe ahead. we should ask um, the reporter if or how they're using it, or if we get rid of it, would that be a huge burden? 
Yeah, and and to to um, to add to this, if I'm not mistaken, in the in in the PR, um, it's already working. The only thing is that instead of having the you know resources to sync arg, you just pass you know command line args without a, um, an arg name. Uh, right. And so this, I mean, the feature is already there. If you if it's just that in terms of you command line UX is just not. 100% good because it's not the same arg name than other commons. But I mean, I'm not sure it's really a, a missing feature. Yeah, if it's just a, a UX uh, bug in this plumbing uh, command line, I, I think I care a lot less about it. Um, do, uh, but for milestones, maybe TBD, just because we think we might close it anyway, or four, so we get credit for closing it. Um, uh, whatever, <laughs> doesn't matter to me. Okay, I will uh, uh, make a note to respond to that. Keep a tab open for it. Um, that's this. This one's from before, oh, I think you asked for clarification. That's probably not new. Um, Flakes 0.4, or is this oh, still occurring? Yeah, Maru said it was still happening. OK. 0.4, let's see. Yeah, I definitely thought we fixed that. I definitely stopped seeing that one. But it's back. Um, Kyle, do you think you want to do this or does somebody reading this, hearing this, want to do this? This might even be a good first issue. Um, I would say, Kyle, if you think you want to do it in the 0.4 time frame, I will 0.4 it. Otherwise, I'll probably 0.5 it. I don't know. I don't feel like it's super high priority. Sure. Personally. Let's five it. Um, documentation is something we've been trying to do more of, better of in point four, right? Do we think? Isn't there a PR open that actually has been yeah. heavily reviewed for this? 627, mm -hmm. let me mark it as fixing. It hasn't merged yet. Um, okay. Well, that would be nice. And then I can, I'll point for it. Something. What do we think? Or this is related oh, five. to five. Five. We're not gonna. I, I doubt we'll make any changes to any of the verbs in O four. Yeah, yeah. I was just checking if that PR was actually closing that, and it doesn't look like this. Um. This one can happen anytime. I would put good first issue and help wanted on it. All right. Um, Let's just put it in TBD to, to put it somewhere. Yeah. So it doesn't keep coming up in this in this query. P4 for sure. Let's see. I mean, yeah. Is that still on your radar, Maru? Can you come back to the top, please? Just yeah. the title. Yeah, thank you. Probably not. Because that, yeah, that, that kind of requires a 
I was planning on doing a wholesale refactor of the sinker and that was going to be part of it, but I don't think that's going to be a near term task. Do you think that's a five then, or is part of this going to be through four and part through five? Um, I would say five is probably more realistic. Mm. Speed up code we, generation. Yeah, TBD. Um, you know, stuff works. It's just slow. Yeah, yeah. Now's our chance to just switch wholesale to the dynamic client. Mm. Or a generic one. Uh, Steve, do you think there's any, I mean, this is already a four month old issue by now. We still want to do this. Um, I think when we get the um, the work that Fabian and Varsha and Nick are working on for some code generation and scoping, I think that will maybe unlock some work we can do here mm -hmm. to try and fix some of that. Um, but it's, it's definitely not going to happen in 04. I will. Put it in 05 I think it, optimistically. Yeah, it makes sense to put it to 05 and then we can remove it if it doesn't work. But I think 05 sounds right to me. Cool. Do you want me to assign you, Fabian? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Not in the org. Also, not showing up here. Uh, I will do this. It's later. Fabian VF is my tag. VF? Yep. All right. That's my car. Matches up. Um, all right. With that, uh, we're at the top of the hour. But thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll see you on the Slack later. Bye, everybody. See you. Bye.